company of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to tell you a story about uh, one of the most uh, painful chapters in my life personally. Uh, but I think it serves a really important purpose for illustrating the gospel lesson. That's why I bring it up. Uh, after I graduated from university, uh, I knew that I wanted to go to seminary, but I needed about a year space between those two, two experiences. And so I decided to spend a year living in intentional Christian community among some other recent uh, college graduates uh, out in Los Angeles and to do social service. And we'd all have our different responsibilities, but we'd also be living in community just for a year, and then we would uh, go off to other things. And uh, so uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> it was a really, really difficult experience for me and for the other participants. There were, there were uh, three other participants. And uh, so we, we lived in this little house. None of us knew each other before that point. And it turned out that we all had radically different expectations of what living in Christian community would be like. Uh, and mine, unfortunately, were the least compromising. Uh, because you see, before this point, I had uh, my ideas about living in community were mostly formed uh, by living in monasteries and things like that, you know, where you have these monks with these very rigorous ways of praying together and all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, and, and certain kinds of assumptions. For example, uh, one of the early things had to do with how do we treat the food in the fridge, you know? Like, would everybody do their individual grocery shopping and then kind of have their own piece of stuff? Or do we buy things together as a group? Or do we do something kind of in the middle? Needless to say, I was an advocate for the your peaches are my peaches, my milk is your milk kind of approach, and just kind of, uh, you know, we'd have a kitty and we'd all kind of buy groceries together, whereas the other people in the group were much more individualistic, they wanted their sort of things. But we kind of compromised on a medium thing kind of in between, but then it turned out that, you know, uh, somebody forgot to label their oranges one day, and I took one of the oranges and ate it, and they were really upset that I ate their orange. <laughs> and that was just like the first thing that happened in like the first week. And I thought to myself, okay, pretty clearly this is about negotiating, you know, all this sort of community stuff. It's all right, you know, we'll work this out. And uh, it, this, this kind of continued to build and build. And, you know, me wanting to do things like pray together once a day uh, was apparently outside the bounds of what other people were comfortable with. So that kind of thing. So uh, as the conflict began to escalate, the guy who was sort of in charge of the program attempted to create some kind of mediation in the group. And he did things like, uh, we did an exercise where we, we kind of made ground rules for the house, right? And so I had some things that I put on there, and they had some things they put on there, and we were kind of happy with that, and that lasted for a couple of weeks. But it just did not go well. <laughs> it did not go well. And to tell the truth, I, I take, a, you know, a good portion of the responsibility, at least 50%, because I had, like I said, I had these ideas about what a holy life looked like and about what a life in community looked like. And I just didn't have room to accommodate uh, these folks I was living with at the time and to meet them where they were. So uh, eventually, uh, I was asked to leave the community. And it was a really hard blow for me at the time. And uh, I had a great year after that, the rest of my year. I spent doing uh, social work with uh, homeless families in Los Angeles. I found a place to live on Manhattan Beach in, California, in Los Angeles, which is like one of the best places to live in the world, I think. I mean, I was just two blocks from the beach. Right, with the volleyball nets and everything, and, and uh, beautiful clean air, which is rare in Los Angeles, uh, coming off the, the ocean. So I had a great time for the rest of the year. And actually, I found that not living in community, being on my own, uh, living in a, a room that I was renting from uh, somebody I'd met in church, uh, meant that I was able to really focus on my prayer life in a, in a really fantastic way. So I was praying like crazy. I was, I was doing all kinds of stuff, and I loved it. And I found it prepared me well for seminary. But here's the problem. That, that break in community that I experienced kind of stuck with me for a while. Um, I really felt badly about what had happened, and I felt like there was some unfinished business there. So years go by, years go by, decades. And uh, about six or nine months ago from now, uh, I was uh, at a conference uh, of church people, of course, uh, talking about mission and all the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And uh, we decide as you do at these conferences, that the most important time is actually after the official conference sessions when people go off to the pubs or to the restaurants or, or whatever. That's where the really great conversations happen and, and people really hash out ideas they're working on and so on. So I was kind of prepared for that. What I wasn't prepared for was that I'd sit down at a table at a pub uh, called the Bishop and Belcher, uh, of all things, uh, in, in, just off of Bloor, and I sat down, and across the table from me was one of the people that I was with in intentional community back in Los Angeles. And it turned out 
that in the intervening years since I had known her, uh, she had decided to uh, become ordained and was, is now serving in a church in Vancouver. And uh, that's so she got invited to this conference and, and she was there. And so, uh, you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit. We certainly knew who each other were. And then we went off to the side and we had a really frank conversation. And we talked about what had happened and, and she updated me on what happened after I left the house. It turned out that my leaving didn't actually help much, uh, that they continued to have a breakdown among the people that were left, the three. And so they ended up all kind of splitting up after that anyway. Uh, and she talked about how they also came to realize that they had really kind of scapegoated me for a lot of stuff, but not that I am off the hook, but you know. So we had this moment of reconciliation. And you know what? It felt like a tremendous burden being lifted off of my shoulders. Like, I'm not saying I thought about this every day or anything like that, but it was something from my past that I was uncomfortable with. And to be able to actually sit down from someone from that period and, and talk through it, and to experience some sense of forgiveness and to offer forgiveness in return, meant that we were reconciled, right? And it was a beautiful thing. And I just felt so good after that. I felt so good. That's the kind of reconciliation, I think, that Jesus is calling us to in this passage. This is the opposite of the kind of dominant narrative that we get in a lot of our culture about how justice is supposed to work or what's supposed to happen when someone has offended us. We are highly programmed to believe in a retributive justice kind of system where the people that are guilty get punished for their wrong deeds and we feel better as a result. The problem with that, one problem, is that if you ask most people who have been hurt or offended in their lives, even if the offender is punished, it usually doesn't make them feel that much better. It doesn't. I mean, so, uh, to be honest, some people do report they're glad that somebody was punished, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily feel like the thing that was broken in their lives by, by the offense that was committed against them is healed. Right? It's not. Because if something has happened to you to hurt you, if someone has violated your person or your property or, or a loved one, no matter what happens to the offender, it doesn't fix the, the harm that was done to you. There's just no way to repay those things. So that dominant narrative is, though, that if we punish them, then that'll fix things, and it doesn't. What Jesus offers here is something very different, something that's actually much less concerned with the rights of the offended than with the care of the offender. And that's a very controversial notion, believe it or not. I mean, I hate to pick on Texas, but you know, they have one of the highest execution rates in the world in terms of uh, the number of capital crimes that are punished with execution. And you know what? They also claim to be this like, hyper-Christian culture, right? Now, I'm sorry, but it's really difficult to reconcile those two things because it's very difficult to hold a passage like this in mind and yet also you know, perpetrate the, the death penalty because in what way can reconciliation be accomplished? Like, no matter how hard-boiled and evil somebody is, if they're alive, there is some hope, some dim hope that they will change. I'm not saying that they'll get out of prison or that they should be released. I'm just saying that there's some chance for them to experience some sort of redemption. And if you just simply kill them, you, you lose that opportunity. You lose that opportunity. You lose that one, as Jesus would say. So here we have this wonderful passage about what to do, and it seems like a lot of common sense. You, you go to the person one-on-one, -on -one, you try to reconcile. If that doesn't happen, you, you bring someone else with you. If that doesn't happen, then you bring it to the larger community. Notice that within all this, even though it starts off with the individuals, the assumption is that this happens within the context of community. So right away, the offense that has been happened is, is immediately contextualized within the entire community. Like immediately this is about something that affects all of us. And even though it may be up to you to go to that person, it's still something that we all sort of share together because we're in this together. Second, uh, it assumes that, that this should be a process that should be ongoing. There's not just an instant, right, where you ask for this uh, reconciliation when it doesn't happen, you kick the guy out. That's, that's not what Jesus calls for. Uh, it, it does give a, a thing here about excluding the people from community, but only after every effort has been made to try to achieve reconciliation. Finally, though, there's this notion in this gospel passage that these acts of reconciliation that we're attempting to do have a kind of eternal consequence. Um, it says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So not only is this something which is important for us to do here for the sake of community, but it seems to have this eternal consequence. There's larger things at stake here than just whether I feel badly about this person or that person, but something about the unity which we hope to accomplish in the kingdom of heaven that we're trying to create. 
So I guess what I would say about these passages about reconciliation is that this is a strongly countercultural narrative about how we are supposed to live together as people. And it calls us to uh, challenge a lot of the inherited notions of our culture about what we're supposed to do about crime, about offenses of small and large scale. And that we as a Christian community are called upon to actualize that amongst ourselves in a very strong way. Tell the truth, I have been, and not just in the, my previous story, but in other times, I've been part of these kinds of situations where I've had people come to me and say that they were offended by what someone else did, and I had to counsel them. And I always kind of went back to this passage. I said, well, have you tried talking to the person? There's a, a great movie, I, I forget the name of it, unfortunately, right off the top of my head. But uh, in it, uh, this, this uh, man had been offended by another man, and the conflict starts escalating. And the guy, uh, the first party, decides that, you know, he, he's uh, asking around among his friends, and one of his friends says, you know, I know a guy who could ruin this other guy's life. He says, really? And so he goes and he meets with this man, and, and they sit down, and the man explains that, yeah, I, uh, I can hack into his bank accounts, I can ruin his credit rating, I can do all these things, I can put all these false stories about him on the internet, I can just ruin his life, ruin his life. And he gets ready to do it, and he, like, he sets up everything on the computer, and he says, are you sure you want to do this? And the, uh, the first party, the, the guy who was offended, said, um, well, I don't have any choice, do I? Like, what other choice do I have? And this guy, this, this mercenary computer hacker, says, yeah, you could talk to the guy. <laughs> he just said, that's what he says, yeah, you could talk to him. And the, this, this guy who, sorry, Trent, he happened to be a lawyer. But anyway, he said, he said, he said no, no, go ahead and do it. <laughs> go ahead and do it. And, and proceeds to wreck this guy's life. And then the rest of the movie, this is about a third of the way through the movie, is about how these two men who continually are, are fighting each other in this massively escalating conflict, eventually toward the end of the movie, they come to this reconciliation and everything kind of starts getting back on track at the end. But it always struck me that there's that decision moment, you know, you could talk to the guy. So I guess what I'm calling us to as, as individuals and something to think about in the next week is that moment when you've had that choice to, to simply talk to the guy or gal. Just talk to them and see what the Holy Spirit might accomplish. Amen.